this subject of sin and how it came into the world is I thought, well, I'd do a little bit of research before I prepared my lecture this evening, or my seminar this evening, and just find out what is the general view of sin. And from my research, most people say that they can't really define what sin is. Don't have, they don't have a definite view of exactly what sin is. But our discussion tonight, our seminar, obviously is based on the Bible. And the Bible is very definite as to what sin is. So let's have a look at that. Firstly, we're going to have a look at just what sin is before we look at its effects. What is sin? Well, we've got a quotation there from 1 John 3, 4, where it says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is transgression of the law. So the Bible is telling us straight away that sin is the transgression of God's law. It's like this cartoon that I've little call out I've got on this cartoon here. It's like somebody saying, look, I know what God says, but I still want that thing that somebody else owns. For example, God says, thou shalt not covet. Now I want you to come to this passage I've got on the screen in Romans chapter 7, verse 7. Towards the end of the New Testament, in Romans chapter 7, we read these words. Now, in fact, Romans chapter 7 starts to talk about the law, and when we say the law in this instance, it's meaning the law of Moses. And here the Apostle Paul is arguing, look, the law of Moses has been done away with, uh, and now we have the law of Christ. And so he says, verse 6, But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead, that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Far be it, as the word God forbid means, far be it. Nay, had I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So the Bible is telling us straight away that and Paul's saying that he, he would not have known what sin was if God had not given him a law. He wouldn't have known what coveting was unless God had said, thou shalt not covet. Now, those words there in verse 7, I had not known lust. The word lust means a longing after something that is not yours, that doesn't belong to you. I had not known lust, except the law said, thou shalt not covet. The word covet really is almost the same Greek word. It means a longing after something which is forbidden. That's what God says. We're not, we're not to, God's given us things we're not to do. And I'm, these, these words, in fact, are taken from Exodus. I want you to come right back to the Old Testament, to Exodus chapter 20, where the, the Ten Commandments were given to Moses. And in fact, the Tenth Commandment in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 17, we read these words. You've got the previous commandments, thou shalt not steal. Verse 15, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbour. Verse 16, verse 17, thou shalt not covet. That means thou shalt not desire to have. Thou shalt not desire thy neighbour's house. Thou shalt not desire thy neighbour's wife, nor his manservant nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbour's. So that's what the law said the, under the Ten Commandments. Now the Lord Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul haven't changed that. They said that still, and the Apostle Paul is saying, that is sin. When I start to want something that God has forbidden, then that is sin. It is transgression of the law. In fact, you're going against God's will. God is the great creator of the whole universe. And when people say, look, I want to do it my way, not God's way, they're challenging God's supremacy. And God will not abdicate. He will not step down to the will of his creatures. God has said, no, 
this is my law and this is what I want you to do. But most men and most women do what they want to do in defiance to God. So in fact, they are sinning. Now the Proverbs, right in the middle of our Bible, one of the wisdoms books, says that even the thought of foolishness is sin. You know, like in that little cartoon there on the screen where this man says, look, I can think this way because nobody knows what I'm thinking. But you see, God does. God knows what we're thinking. And even the thought of foolishness, as we've seen coveting, if somebody wants something in their heart, they mightn't say it to anybody, but that is sin. So once again, we're challenging God. God says, you're not to do that, so we're challenging God. James chapter 4, come across in the New Testament now to James chapter 4 and verse 17. Towards the end of the New Testament, after the book of Hebrews, in James chapter 4. In this last part of James chapter 4, James is talking about how we should deal with one another. For example, he says in verse 11, Speak not evil one of another, brethren. Or then he says, look in verse 16, Don't go out and say you're going to do this today and that tomorrow because you don't know what the day's going to bring. What we should say, if the Lord will. Don't boast in what you do, he says, because God's in control of everything. But then he says, finally in verse 17, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So if we know what God requires of us and we defy God, then that is sin. There's, there's the Bible definitions. The Bible definition of sin is quite clear. It's opposing what God has said and doing what we want to do. That's what sin means. So it's challenging God's supremacy. Here's another one. Sin blinds our eyes. This time it's in the first epistle of John. So we're nearly there if we go over a couple of books to the first epistle of John and chapter 2. We read these words in verse 9. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him, verse 8, and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. He that saith, he is in the light. In other words, he that says he knows the true way, he has the truth. He that says he is in the truth, in the light, and he hates his brother, is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light. So we've got hate and darkness representing sin and light representing truth. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because darkness hath blinded his eyes. Or in other words, sin has blinded his eyes. Now you might get a person who says, look, I'm a very good Bible student, I know everything the Bible says, and I love God. But if that person says, oh, but... I don't like that person down there. I don't, I've got a problem with that person. I hate that person. Then that's sin. And God says, we're not really being truthful. We're actually walking in darkness. So sin's not just some simple thing. It's a transgression of God's law that goes right to our hearts and to the thinking of our minds. We need to really analyse what's going on in our own minds. Well, when did the first sin occur? Well, we've got a definition. Come to Romans. We're in the New Testament still. Romans chapter 5. When did the first sin occur? In Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul, who wrote this book, tells us in verse 12, he says, Wherefore... As by one man, and he's referring to the first man, Adam, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So we've got, and I've got it on the screen there, very important that we remember this process. Man was first, then men sinned, then death was brought into the world, and as a consequence of that, all men have sinned. 
And we just need to understand what that's saying. It doesn't mean that God has made all men sinners. It means that because they inherit the consequences of Adam's sin, that they're now like Adam and they inevitably will sin. God doesn't make them sin. They sin through their own free will and volition, but it's part of their constitution. Man, sin, death, and everybody, the Bible says, as a result of that, everybody sins. Everybody. With the exception of one person, that was the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what does the word sin mean? Well, the, sin, the word sin, if we take the meaning of the word sin in the New Testament, and I've got a, 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 a target there with an arrow, and it's like an archer going out of the field and he pulls the arrow and aiming for the centre of the, the target, misses the target, goes off to one side. And that's what the word, which is the word hamatus, means, the word sin in the New Testament. It means to miss the mark, to fall short. And Adam and Eve did that. They missed the mark and they fell short. Now we do that. We miss the mark. God says, look, this is what you need to do, but we don't do it. We fall short. Adam and Eve first, they pleased themselves and they didn't please God. But they sinned. They missed the mark. In the Old Testament, the word has got the same sort of idea. In the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, the word is chata. And in Genesis 39, verse 9, where it's referring to Joseph. And Joseph says what was happening to him with Pharaoh's, uh, with Potiphar's wife. You nearly made me to sin or to miss the mark. It means to, to uh, deviate from the right way. It's got the same idea. So it means just missing. God has said this is the way, walk ye in it. And we go slightly to the left of that or to the right of that. We have sinned. We've missed the mark. So the definition of sin. Man first, God. And the Bible tells us quite clearly... And we need to understand this. This is a vital principle. God is not responsible for sin. Man is responsible for sin in the world. When, when God created man, man was created in the Bible, as it's termed, very good. Man could have either gone one way or the other. But under probation, man sinned. The consequence of that sin was death. And as a result, we are all sinners. Let's have a look at this law in Genesis chapter 2 where God created Adam and he gave Adam a law in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17. He says, look, he placed Adam in the garden, a beautiful garden. And he says, look, of every tree, Genesis 2 verse 17, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thou shalt, thereof thou shalt surely die. The margin of my Bible, and I've put it on the screen for you, the words, thou shalt surely die, means that the dying process would start. It doesn't mean that as soon as Adam sinned, that he died, because he didn't. Adam lived for 930 years after this day. But he became a dying creature. And the Bible's quite clear on that. Adam sinned, God punished sin with death. Why did God do that? Well, the serpent had said pretty much the same sort of words. You know, in Genesis chapter 3 that we read this evening, the serpent had said to the woman, in verse 3, but of the fruit of the... The woman says to the serpent, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, just... A couple of important points here. The serpent was a creature that was part of God's creation. It was a very good creature. It was expressing an animal, its animal thinking, the way it viewed things. That's all it was doing. And the serpent simply said, you shall not, shall. in verse 4, the serpent said, you won't die. Now, it was a lie. And by the way, that's the lie that the whole world believes because most of the people in the world today believe when you die, you don't really die, but your soul goes to heaven. Now, the Bible doesn't teach that. The serpent taught that, but the Bible doesn't teach that. 
But Eve said to the serpent there in verse 3, You shall not eat of it. And that's because God said you shall not eat of it. But you'll notice that she, she then embellishes that a little bit more. Neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. So she's taken the word of God and she's added some extra requirements. God didn't say that. God simply said, you shall not eat of that tree. She's put some extra teaching that she thought was right, but God never, ever said that. But the serpent said the lie. The serpent said, you won't die. Now, the woman listened to the reasoning of the serpent. She listened to animal reasoning. And as a result of that, she induced her husband to do the same. In effect, what Eve was saying, look, I want to do it my way. God says, this is the way I want you to do it. They challenged God's supremacy. I want you to understand that point. There was a God says, thou shalt not touch that tree. Thou shalt not eat of that tree. Not touch it. Thou shalt not eat of that tree. They challenged God's supremacy. They said, well, look, we think it'll be okay. And they ate of it. They had now introduced a duality, a duality into the universe. By that I mean, they thought, well, they could challenge that their thinking was superior to God's thinking. Now, God had no choice. God had said, this is what I want man to do. Man said, no, I want to do it this way. God had no choice now but to remove that challenge by imposing death. And that's what God was doing. He said, you break this law, you'll die. And so he imposed, and the process of dying started. It was not part of Adam when he was created. He was not created mortal. Subject, the word mortal means subject to death. He was capable of dying, but he was not subject to death. So now he was subject to death, and he and Eve were going to die. You know, there in verse 5 we read, the serpent said, For God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You'll be like the angels, the serpent reasoned. You'll understand good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So what actually happened? What was the process? Firstly, they, they looked, they saw it was pleasant to their eyes. Now, that was a mental process. It was in their thinking, in their heads. They started to think. Then it became part of their, not just their thinking, became part of their consciousness, became a part of their conscience. And they desired to be like the gods, to be like the angels. They desired to be wise but in disobedience to God. So now it was a moral process, and then finally she put forth her hand and took of it and partook of the tree and ate. It was a physical act. Now I'll put it to you, ladies and gentlemen, every sin that we commit is based on that principle. It first is mental, then moral, then physical. What we allow into our heads affects our thinking, then affects our actions. And that's what happened with Eve, mental, moral, and physical. Now, I've got a quotation there, once again, from 1 John. Let's come across to 1 John and verse 2, because nothing's changed. That's right in the beginning of the Bible. The Bible says, she looked, she desired, and she took. Now, right over in 1 John 2, right at the end of the Bible, God says, look, the process is still working in men and women. 1 John 2 and verse 15 he says love not the world love not the world by the way that word love there in verse 15 is the Greek word agape which means sacrifice sacrificial love God is saying don't sacrifice your life for the world now, the word world actually is the word cosmos, which means the orderly arrangement of things. The world out there at large, the way it's arranged. Don't sacrifice yourself for the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, 
the way the things are operating out there in the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, that word lust, the desire to do something that's not yours, to partake of something that's not yours, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Same as in Genesis chapter one and verse, chapter three and verse six. Eve looked. She put it became part of her thinking. She was she wanted to be like the Elohim. She was proud. The lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and the lust of the flesh operated in Eve. And they became now a part of the operation in the life of every man and woman in the world. But the Bible is saying we have to grapple with that and realize that that can be a problem for us. Because he says in verse 17, the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So we need to grapple with that. He failed. Now we inherit the consequences of Eve and Adam's failure. What did they do? Well, Genesis 3 verse 7 tells us that they took fig leaves and they sewed fig leaves together to cover their bodies up because they realized that they were naked and they were ashamed of what they had done. But an important point about this, this was not God's covering for sin, this was man's covering for sin. You know, there's lots of religions out there in the world today. Which religion is what is right? Well, the religion that is correct, as far as God is concerned, is the religion that takes God's word and follows God's word. Now, lots of people say that, so you really have to try that and test those spirits. Lots of people say that. But here was the first different religion in the, in the world, different to God's, because here was Eve and Adam. They were going to have their own covering for sin was only partial, was only temporary, it provided no real protection and having come from a tree it only reminded them of sin. It wasn't a suitable covering for sin. That's what the Bible tells us. We read that in Genesis chapter 3 tonight. It wasn't suitable. So God would provide an effective cover. God is the only one that provides an effective cover for sin. What were the effects of that sin in the Garden of Eden? Well in Genesis chapter 3 we read in verse 14 and the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, and upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. So number one, God had passed a sentence on the serpent, this creature that was able to talk, and made the suggestion to Eve, which she accepted. God cursed that serpent, would go upon it became a creature that was now different, would go upon its belly, and it would eat dust. But then we read in verse 15 that God would do something else. He says, with this serpent, he said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, how did God put enmity between the serpent and the woman? Did God sort of inject something into Eve or into Adam that made them, the word enmity means an enemy with? Well, no, he didn't. What God did, he actually gave his word. The word of God created the enmity. God doesn't jump inside of people and make people do things, but he gives them his word, and it's the word of God that creates the enmity. Some people take the Bible and say, look, I believe this is the word of God. A lot of people say, oh, that's a lot of nonsense. I don't want it. It's going to control my life. I'm not interested in it. And there's an enmity. But you've got two classes of people, you see. You've got a class of person who says, yes, I accept the word of God, and a class of person who doesn't. Now, when God says, I will put enmity between thee, the serpent, and the serpent in the Bible came to represent sin power, sin manifested in all sorts of ways, in individuals, in, in bodies of people, sin itself, 
So the serpent come to represent sin in the Bible. I will put enmity between thee and the woman. And the woman in the Bible, the woman came to represent the persons that speak the truth. Now, how do we know that? Well, because you see, when we come back in Genesis chapter 3, the woman said, you know, in verse 1, now the serpent was more subtle, that means it was wiser, it was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made and said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the servant, We may not eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. You see, the woman spoke the truth. She sinned, and Adam was the one that was held accountable for the sin. But she failed, and Adam failed. But she spoke the truth, and because the woman spoke the truth, she come to represent all those who speak God's word, the truth. So God says, look, I'm going to put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. And then it says, it shall bruise thy head. Well, the word it in the original of most translations is the word he. It's referring to somebody. He shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. It's a prophecy that speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the one that eventually, he, the seed of the woman in the Bible, he is the one who would bruise sin power in the head. And sin power would bruise the Lord Jesus Christ in the heel. We're going to see how that happened a little bit down the track. But that's one of the effects of God now pronouncing this sentence on the serpent. What happened next? Well, as it said, it would bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. He would, the seed of the woman would bruise the seed of the, the serpent in the head. The woman, we're told, would suffer sorrow in conception and in bringing forth children. That was come as a result of sin. So things had changed. The woman was to look to her husband now for spiritual guidance. We're told that in the end of verse 16. When it says, he shall rule over thee, it really means he will be your priestly leader. He will be the one that will bring you back to God. The ground was cursed, we're told. Verse 18. Thorns and thistles would it bring forth. And we're told that Adam would work by the sweat of his brow. So as a result of sin, the world had changed quite dramatically. There were effects upon the world, there were effects upon the animals, and there was a, a major effect upon man himself. Man would return to the dust from which he was taken. Now man was mortal. He wasn't mortal before that. He was capable of dying, but he wasn't subject. Now he was subject to death. And so the law of death also involved a fixation within man and that is a bias or a proneness to sin. Now, it doesn't tell us that in Genesis chapter 3. But this is an important point of Bible teaching. Not only did Adam and Eve's sin bring death, but it brought within man a principle that was a bias towards sin, a proneness towards sin. I want you to come with me to that passage in Romans chapter 7 and verse 23. Once again, it's the Apostle Paul, and, and we looked at this seventh chapter already this evening. Romans chapter 7 and verse 23. He says, look, verse 22, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity, to the law of sin which is in my members. So Paul is saying, look, not only is man mortal, but he finds now within his body, he finds this law that when he wants to do the right thing, he's got this law that makes him, or tries to make him, do the wrong thing. He's got the choice to try and do something about that. And then in chapter 8, we're told that the whole of God's creation as a result of sin was made subject to vanity. That means it, it was just 
Nothing was, was perfect anymore. It was all vanity. As a result of sin. So the effects of sin were catastrophic, to say the least. God had purposed that man should be this wonderful creature, and all this had changed. Let's have a look in Romans chapter 8 and verse 2. A little bit more about this law of sin and death. In Romans chapter 8, Paul says, look, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ can change that. He says in verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who, which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So the Bible actually talks about the law of sin and death, two things. And you can see on my screen there, the word sin means sin proneness. We're subject to a proneness to sin. So decisions arise in our body that cause us to make wrong decisions. We're sin prone. Have a look at this passage. In James chapter 1 and verse 13. James chapter 1 and verse 13. Let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So we can't blame God. The scriptures are telling us that our temptations come from within us, our own lusts, our own desires. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished, it bringeth forth death. Now an important point comes out of this. We are not held accountable because we have this law of sin in our bodies, this proneness to sin. It's only when we actually sin that God says, you've done something wrong. And we all sin. But because we have this which we inherit from Adam because of his transgression, God does not punish us. Man is not punished. Now I might just make the point here that there is a religion, the Catholic Church, believes in a term they call original sin. Now the teaching, the Catholic teaching about original sin is, as a result of Adam and Eve's sin, the whole world is a sinners, and they call it original sin, and there needs to be, you take a little child and you're sprinkling with water to cover him for that original sin. That is not a Bible doctrine. God does not hold us accountable because of this nature. It's our misfortune, not our crime, that we've got this nature. It becomes a crime when we sin, and we all sin, but when we sin, that's what requires forgiveness. Our nature does not require, what our nature requires is changing. That's what it requires, changing, not forgiveness. So we possess, as we see on the screen there, a natural, physical, and physiological that means physiological, it, it even goes on in your brain. We possess this susceptibility for doing what appeals to us despite moral obligations to reject that appeal. Just come back to Romans chapter 7 and verse 21. We've already been there tonight, but this time, just a couple of a verse earlier. Romans 7 and verse 21. I find then, Paul says, a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Paul found that, and if we're honest with ourselves, we all find that. We've got this law of our members, and it's called the law of sin, which ends up in death because we, uh, we, we sin as a result of it, and everybody sins. But we are not held accountable for that nature. We inherit it because of Adam's sin. Now, 
How then would God deal with this? This is what's happened to the world. It's a terrible state. Well, as I said to you in Genesis chapter 3, the seed of the woman, which is Jesus Christ, would bruise sin power in the head. And if you bruise, as you can see on the screen there, a serpent in the head, you kill a snake. And you're not supposed to kill snakes, by the way. They're protected, but I've killed a few in the house. And you generally try to crush it in the head. It's fatal. Symbolically, it's saying the Lord Jesus Christ crushed sin power in the head. When did Jesus Christ crush sin power in the head? I mean, the world's full of it. Where did he do it? Well, let's have a look at Hebrews chapter 2. It's interesting, the language of Hebrews chapter 2 talks about in verse 8 <clears throat> the Lord Jesus Christ putting all things verse 8 of Hebrews 2 thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet you know that's what Genesis 3:15 said would happen that the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head here it is thou hast put and this is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ here in Hebrews chapter 2 Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he has put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him, but we see not yet all things put under him. Because the world's still full of sin. It's only been accomplished in Christ himself. Christ has destroyed sin. The Lord Jesus Christ was born into the same constitution as you and I. The Lord Jesus Christ partook of that same law of sin and death. He had the same proneness to sin as you and I, but he never let it operate in his life. He crushed that in the head in himself. But he hasn't put the whole world under that subjection yet. That's his work to come in the future when sin will finally be destroyed. How can we prove that? How can we say that? Well, you see it says here in Hebrews 2 and verse 14, going on to talk about Christ. For as much then... As the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise. You know, it's reinforcing the point. Here's Jesus Christ. Also himself likewise took part of the same. It's reinforcing the point that Jesus Christ is the same in that respect as his nature as you and I. That, why? That through death, through death he might destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil so it says that Christ had to go through death and it means come out again to destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil now as Christadelphians it's not our Bible subject tonight the doctrine of the devil it, it's not a supernatural power the devil really is a synonym for human nature it's the law of sin and death within us if you like the proneness to sin and the Lord Jesus Christ Christ that's what it's saying he destroyed that power within himself he put it to death when he died on the tree that's what I've got on the screen there and so we're told that eventually Christ must eventually reign till he's put all enemies under his feet and the last enemy that he destroys will be death Okay, how then did God deal with sin? Well, we've, we've seen what Christ has done with sin in himself. We're told there in Genesis that the Lord God made coats of skin. And that was a skin, we're told, of a lamb. It doesn't tell us in Genesis that it was a lamb, but in Revelation, we're told that it was a skin of a lamb, which pointed forward to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then God provided angels to keep the way of the tree of life open. We're told in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 24 that God's plan, God's way to eternal life would be kept open by his angels. That's what that was saying. Why didn't God just leave man to his fate? Well, God is supreme and he cannot let man's challenge go without a response. God cannot allow man's sin to frustrate his purpose that he had in placing man upon the earth. Now, God's purpose is that he, was to, he wanted this earth, that is still his purpose, that he wants this earth to be full of his glory. 
to be inhabited by men and women who manifest God's character. The question now was, how could God, while maintaining his principles of righteousness and his supremacy, offer a solution? Man had brought sin into the world. What was God going to do? Well, the principle involved that man should die because of sin. We've seen that. God said he had to die. But that he also may in some way be involved in the eternal purpose of God. So God had to institute a plan. What was the purpose of God's creation with man? Well, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, and I see that I'm really running out of time here. Something must be wrong with that clock, I think. God's purpose was that he wanted men and women, as we're told in Genesis chapter 1, to have dominion over the animals of the world. That's what it says. Now, that doesn't mean that God wants men and women to be lion tamers or great tamers of leopards and elephants. It means that God wants men and women to have their thinking superior to the thinking of animals. But most people in the world out there today think like animals. In fact, the Bible, when the Bible deals with prophecy, and it deals with most of the countries in prophecy, the countries are really referred to as beasts. And the Bible says that men are like beasts, but God doesn't want us to be like beasts. He wants us to be like him. So God's purpose was that men and women should develop their minds to be godlike, not animal-like. And of course he failed, he listened to the serpent. He was to fill the earth with the descendants who reflected this objective, we're told in Numbers 14 and 21. Man must have dominion over the carnal mind. But now that man had marred God's work, what was God to do? Well, he could destroy everything and start again, but that would show that God's it was a failure. Now, the thing he could do, he might have said, well, I can tolerate sin. I'll let the earth fill up with people who are sinners and the earth would be a terrible place. It's bad enough now. God tries to control sin. He's introduced his word. But that's without introducing God's word. And so the third method was to enforce a law against sin and at the same time leave the door open for mercy to repentant and obedient to God's sinners. And this way has been adopted by God. So God says, look, my law that men have to die will be carried out, but I will introduce a plan. And here it is. It's in this word of God here that people can be saved. My righteousness is still upheld. My law is still upheld. But man can be saved. How is this plan to be carried out? Well, God in his mercy immediately after the sin in Eden provided a way back for man, even though man tried to do it himself by covering up the shame of his transgression with fig leaves. God took an innocent lamb. It was sacrificed and the skin taken as a symbolic covering of that sin that had now separated the man and the woman. And God was showing that he would take one who, though innocent of actual transgression, would give his life as an atonement for sin, and he would do so by destroying sin power at its very source in a man himself. So how did God deal with this sin? Well, God's way of dealing with sin is a way in righteousness in which kindness and justice converge. It would not be kind or just to say, I will let you go free if that man will die. Now, I just want you to think about this point. This is called substitution. Most churches teach that Jesus Christ died instead of us. The Bible doesn't teach that. God would not be kind to say, well, Jesus Christ died instead of us because everybody still dies anyhow. So that's not what it is. It's not substitution. God's plan is a masterpiece, a triumph of divine wisdom. This cannot be said of substitution, a way in which a righteous man would be put to death upon which death had no claims. God now says, I'll receive you back, and that's all men and women, I will receive you back and I will forgive you. 
My righteousness has been declared in this man that was crucified, Jesus Christ. I have crowned him with everlasting life. And because he loved righteousness and hated iniquity and was obedient unto death, it is in him for you, if you will submit and believe in him and put on his name, which is a confession that you have no name of your own that will stand, obey his commandments and I will receive you back for his sake and ye shall be my sons and daughters. So in other words, what God is saying, this man that we see crucified here on this tree, I want you to identify with him. We as Christadelphians, as Bible students, do not believe that Jesus Christ died as a substitute. Jesus Christ died as a representative. And we need to identify with what he did. We need to say what Christ did is right, what God required of his son is right, and we identify with that. And that's what God asks us to do. We need to recognize his position, we need to repent, and God says he will accept us back. Now God says he will forgive us. Let's go to this passage this time in Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3, and verse 25 we read, or verse 24, or verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth, to be a propitiation. Now I've got this on the screen here. God has set Jesus Christ forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the, for the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Now a number of things are coming out of this verse. Firstly, God says he wants his righteousness declared. And Jesus Christ did that in the way he lived his life. But God says in us recognizing what Jesus Christ did, there is forgiveness. The word remission means passing out. He will pass over our sins through the forbearance of God. That means God brings forgiveness. That's the most important thing. He will forgive us. Because what Christ has done, God forgives us. But it's not just like that. It's not just like saying, well, go ahead and sin, God forgives you. God forgives us, but there are conditions on which God forgives us. What are the conditions? Well, the condition of forgiveness, it says, is the propitiatory setting forth of Christ as an object of faith. Now, that's quite technical. What are we trying to say here? Well, the word propitiation means mercy seat. That's what it means. That doesn't help us much. What's that mean? It's rendered mercy seat in other parts of the Bible. Well, the mercy seat was this seat here on the ark. This is the when the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness in the tabernacle, in the most holy place, there was this ark. The ark symbolized the place where God met with men where once a year the high priest would come in and the sins of the people, the whole nation, God would forgive the whole nation on this day of atonement. What actually happened? What happened? There's children of Israel were encamped around the tabernacle and inside the tabernacle, when you look at the plan, the priest would take some burning coals from off this altar here. He would bring it right in here to the altar of incense. He would place the burning coals on this altar of incense and the smoke would waft into this most holy place in here where was the ark. The ark was a symbol where God dwelt and where he would commune with men. On this day, in, in Leviticus chapter 16, we're told, on this day, the nation's sins were forgiven. It was the day of atonement. It could only be done on one day. 
And the mercy seat represented the place where God was and he gave for the forgiveness of sins. Now the Bible tells us here that Jesus Christ is that mercy seat. He's the place where God forgives sins. Not the place, he's the person through whom God forgives sins. Now in the Old Testament times they had to do it every, only once a year. But when Christ died, that veil in the temple, there's the veil in the temple, there's the high priest, supposedly bringing the coals in, going to put them on the altar of incense. When Christ died, that veil that was torn from the top to the bottom, not the bottom to the top, the top to the bottom. Now that veil was as thick as my hand, nearly a hundred millimetres thick, four inches. Very thick veil tore from the top to the bottom. A symbol saying, there it is there, that Christ, when Christ died, and that's what happened when Christ died, that the way was now open for all men and women through Christ to come to Christ any time of the day, anywhere in the world, to seek for forgiveness. That's what it's saying there in, in Romans chapter 3. Christ is our mercy seat, but there are conditions and we can come to Christ for the forgiveness of sins. But why did God require his son to die? Why does he want his son to die for the forgiveness of sins? Well, because the death of Christ declared the righteousness of God as the grounds for the exercise of his forbearance or his forgiveness. Now, just bear with me. I'm going to explain what that means. That is, God maintains his righteousness and his own supremacy in forgiving us. In other words, he was a man who was born the same nature as you and I. He was related to death and God required him to die. Why did God require him to die? He requires us to recognize these principles that, not only, that God was righteous in requiring Jesus Christ to die for the remission of our sins. But why? How could the death of Christ declare the righteousness of God? Well, it had to be a man who was a partaker of the same flesh and blood as us all, and through his death, annul, destroy, and neutralize that which is destroying all of us. Christ had to overcome that which we cannot overcome, and he did. He neutralized that. Jesus was born that he might die. That was the, the, why he came into the world, that he might destroy sin power. For well, thus was the righteousness of God to be declared and sin condemned in his own flesh. Not only did sin have to be condemned, but resurrection had to come in harmony with the law that made sin the wages of sin. Now when we say here, thus was the righteousness of God to be declared and sin condemned in his own flesh, we do not mean that Christ had something in his flesh that needed condemning. We mean that in his body, this is what the Bible means, in his body, that was the arena where sin was overcome. That's what that means. It was in his body that sin was overcome. The resurrection of Christ was not to be merely a restoration to life, but it was to provide an administrator of the glorious results that would be achieved. The raising up of one who would be a mediator between God and man. And he must needs be the dispenser of the forgiveness and the salvation through God. And the judge of all who would be fit to receive these great gifts. All is required that the sacrificial victim should be a perfectly righteous man. But there is another aspect signified in the death of Christ. It wasn't only the righteousness of God. We've seen Christ declared the righteousness of God. It was right that Christ should die. But the second is, as it says in Romans 3, for the condemnation of sin in the flesh. Now, when we say sin in the flesh, we don't mean we cut my flesh open to sin in the flesh. It was a condemnation of sin in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was the, that's the other point. The crucifixion of Christ 
as the declaration of the righteousness of God and the condemnation of sin in the flesh exhibited to the world, to the world the righteous treatment of sin. How did Christ exhibit to the world the righteous treatment of sin? Well, he never let it operate in his body. And finally, he said, even this body that's got this law of sin within it, the only way it can be destroyed, the only way it can be overcome, it has to be put to death. And Christ recognized that principle, that his body had to be put to death. His sin was to be destroyed. And so the crucifixion of Christ was a proclamation to all the world how condemned human nature should be treated according to the righteousness of God. It is fit only for destruction. So we need to think about our own natures. When we don't have any righteousness of ourselves. We are fit only for destruction. And Christ met that principle. But because he never sinned, the grave could not hold him and God brought him forth from the grave. Can we refer to Christ as crucifying sin in himself if he never sinned? Well, it's because of the language. We use the term metonymy. Scripture uses a figure of speech known as metonymy. The impulses that lead to sin are metonymically referred to as sin. Christ has the, had the impulses as part of his physical constitution, but he never succumbed to them. We need to understand that. So when it says in another place in our Bible that Christ was made sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God, the word made, Christ was made sin for us, is the word he was formed or fashioned. Christ was fashioned the same constitution as you and I, that we might be made, and this time the word made means we are constituted righteous. We're not righteous, but because we believe in what God has done with Jesus Christ, God imputes righteousness to us. And so we have, in the Lord Jesus Christ, a great high priest. We have one that has been tried and tempted at all points like as we have, yet without sin. So we're told, we're exhorted that we should hold fast to our profession. And that word means what we profess to believe. If we profess to believe these things, that sin is a problem, that Christ overcomes sin, and that he manifested the righteousness of God, then we need to live that out in our lives too. We need to recognize that Christ truly is God's great high priest. What are we to do? Well, come finally to Romans chapter 6 and verse 3. What are we to do? If we know all that, God does not ask us to be put to death. He asked his son to destroy sin power in himself. He does not ask us to do that. But he asks us to be identified with the Lord Jesus Christ in baptism. He says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, and this means if we go through the waters of baptism, typically dying like Christ did, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth, we should not serve sin. Now it doesn't mean that the body of sin is destroyed. We still have these, this proneness to sin. But we've made a commitment that we will not serve sin. We will serve Christ. And in our mind, we are different people. So God asks us to do that in accepting this teaching of Christ. So in summary, what do we see? That sin is missing the mark of God's ways. God is a great king and he cannot abdicate to sin. Man, though created very good, has marred God's creation by adopting animal thinking. Man frustrated God's purpose of filling the earth with his glory by man's sinning. And God was left with no choice but to destroy sin by death. 
but God in his mercy has provided the way back to him through the obedience of his son who destroyed sin at its very source and maintained God's righteousness. Faith in what God has done is the basis for the forgiveness of sins. And finally, that faith is manifest in baptism, typically dying with Christ and rising in newness of life in him.